Okay, so for Manufacturing Day 2020, we're doing um, Zoom interviews, and today we have with us Akeen White, who is the plant manager at Greystone, Virginia, located in Tuano. So um, for folks who might not be familiar with Greystone, what can you tell us about your product or your process, what raw materials you use, what your final product is, who your customers are? Mm -hmm. So Greystone of Virginia, we're a metal finishing company. So what does that mean? So we electroplate and electrolyst plate um, precious metals or metals in general. Uh, so we have several different processes in which we um, apply a thin film to metals to improve their condition for further processing for our customers. So we do anodized coating uh, here in house at, in Virginia. Uh, we are, have the ability to do electroless nickel plating. I um, mean, we have the ability to do chrome plating as well. Um, so we are not the only, uh, or Virginia is not our only facility. Uh, we do have two other uh, plants in the United States. Uh, both of those are in Rhode Island. And we have uh, some joint ventures as well as other business that we conduct in the European markets as well and another in, in, in China as well. So a joint venture in China with, a, with another partner. So for Virginia, uh, we only do plating at our facility. And so what I understand from having gone through your facility, there's tiny components of like in the automotive industry um, and I think in the firearms industry where there's specific pieces that take a lot of impact during the mechanical use um, of the overall engine or, or firearm. And those pieces, that, that plating that you do helps to, um, what, I guess, augment the surface so that it can take that impact better and therefore last longer, right? And not be sort of the piece that it causes overall failure. Correct. So the, the chrome plating, uh, improves the durability of the metal. So the product that we plate are assembled in fuel injectors, uh, typically in fuel injectors um, in, for the automotive market. So customers that we service would be uh, the larger companies that you see. So the uh, Toyotas, the Ford companies, the Mazda, that's where our, those are the end users of the products that we make here in house. So if you're driving around in a camera, you likely have an injector um, with product that was plated in Virginia. If you're driving a uh, Ford F-150 specifically, you're likely driving around in a, uh, driving around with an injector that went through our plant. Um, on the anodizing side, uh, we do uh, process product for firearms, right? Uh, so the big markets that we service are the assault rifle market. So the M-14s, uh, we have a big market with those uh, those big suppliers. So the Rugers of the world, uh, we supply those. Uh, Smith & Wessons, we supply those. So if you own a Smith & Wesson uh, AR-15 or if you own a Ruger uh, AR-15, the likelihood that it traveled through Virginia is very high. So um, we kind of want to talk a little bit about your path, how, how maybe you found your way to manufacturing or Greystone specifically. Um, I guess that's a good place to start because we also then want to cover some other opportunities or some advice you might give um, to students who are trying to find their path now. But um, I think it's probably best to start maybe with you and what you've experienced. What did you think you wanted to do in high school and how did that how did that go for you? Like, how, how did you end up here? OK, uh, in high school, I participated in, I believe it's still called this, the VOTEC program. Um, so at my high school, Arcadia High School on the Eastern Shore of Virginia, uh, I participated in the computer uh, science or computer literacy program uh, my junior and senior years of high school. So I left high school knowing or thinking that I would do something with computers. Um, I furthered my education at Old Dominion University in which I obtained an electrical engineering degree and I simultaneously joined the Army and I commissioned as a second lieutenant at the uh, completion of my degree. I traveled, traveled on to be an engineering officer uh, in the United States Army stationed down at Fort Bragg. Um, at the completion of my service, I joined the Greystone team. 
Uh, I joined the Greystone team as a production supervisor, and I slowly worked my way up to the position that I currently hold. Uh, so that's where I started and how it introduced me uh, to manuf and how it led me to manufacturing. Um, when I was in high school, I did not think um, I would be a plant manager um, ever. I thought that I would be a computer programmer, someone working either on computer hardware or working on computer software. I had no indication when I was a young 17, 18 year old that I would be where I am now. So did anybody in high school point you in the computer science direction or was that just your choice or why did you choose that in high school? I chose it in high school because it interests me and it interests me because others didn't want to do it. And I like to do the challenging things that no one else wants to do. And um, that's just personal preference to me. Um, so that's why I did it. Okay. So what, what would you do differently if you were in high school now, knowing what you know now? I would ask the questions or I would ask to see more. That, that would be my take or my, my advice to the college student is ask to see more because what you think is not out there is likely right under your nose and you just don't know that it's there. I.e. the manufacturing facilities in the greater Williamsburg area, right? We have a ton of manufacturing opportunities that we just aren't aware of. So what opportunities are there in manufacturing generally, would you say, and what kind of person is a good fit for those kinds of positions? Like what sort of student, what's the profile of the person who maybe should start thinking to themselves, this could be a good fit for me? Someone who does not mind, I'll put it, if you don't mind working and you don't mind thinking while you work, if, if that makes any sense, right? Because we need hard workers, but we also need thinkers as well. So manufacturing can take presumably everyone because everyone can add value to a manufacturing facility because if you want to work, right, you're likely gonna be a hard worker and everyone's a thinker. So we could take everyone. Now, in manufacturing, and in Greystone in particular, are there opportunities for both high school graduates and college graduates or, or not? Right, so why did I say we could take everyone? Because we have roles for everyone. From a regular uh, employee who has no manufacturing experience, we have jobs and positions for entry levels employees, and we also have job and positions available for employees who have bachelor's degrees, employees who have furthered their education to some degree. We have positions open, or we have positions available in the accounting, in the accounting departments, uh, management levels, engineering levels, um, as well as technical levels as well. We also have uh, openings or positions available for entry level workers. So the individuals who didn't pursue further education, we have training programs in place to train those individuals so that they can apply the training that we give them to the applications that we ask. And, oh, go ahead, Sherry. I was just going to say one thing you said earlier about, um, I think you said human resources and accounting. I think that's one thing our students don't realize is that it's not just on the line kind of putting parts together, but that there is HR, there is marketing, there is accounting and finance, and there's different types of jobs that you could get in a manufacturer company. And I just don't think they realize those opportunities exist. Yes, those opportunities are available. Uh, we have a full accounting department. As you spoke, we have a, a human resource specialist. We have a human resource uh, department. Um, we have what we call our chem lab department. And that's our, that area is full of technicians. So all technical uh, employees that have gone through whatever uh, additional chemical training needed to handle those chemicals. We have a shipping and receiving department like most manufacturing areas. So it's, I, I, I think when people think of a uh, manufacturer, you know, we, we have a picture in our heads of just big machines and everyone's at a machine and mm -hmm. everyone's all hands on. That's not the case. That That is the case in some manufacturing facilities, but not ours. And most 
manufacturing facilities have the full gambit, right? You have the machines and the operators down at that level running those machines, but there is still a bigger business that needs to be run. And that's where why you need your accounting department, you need your human resource specialist, you need your engineering team, you need your customer service team. And all of those create the umbrella of a manufacturing company. Not just one of those can exist. We need all of that, right? Right. And even on that line now, I mean, I know after touring the um, companies during manufacturing day, it's not just hands-on putting parts together. You're, you have to have those technical skills to know how to set that machine and if anything goes wrong, because machines are doing a lot of those putting parts together now instead of the person. Correct. That's correct. Um, and that's where I can apply some of my hands-on experiences from my past, right? So from my entry level jobs that I've held, from my production supervisory role, from my uh, computer uh, experience and computer work that I've done in, in, in high school and in college, I apply those skills on the technical side when I need to go down to troubleshoot or if I'm tasked with troubleshooting um, or if I need to troubleshoot something to assist with fixing a problem or solving a problem. So one thing that strikes me um, from touring your facility is the sort of the tolerance, the tight tolerance for your final product and the testing and QC quality control that's involved in making sure that those tolerances are fit. So I know that's true in a, much of manufacturing. I mean, it's very detailed work. It's not necessarily, um, you know, um, loose work where you just kind of pop pieces together, right? I mean, this is this is really technical and has to be highly accurate. I think, um, aren't your tolerances like in the realm of the width of a human hair kind of stuff? <laughs> yeah, so in, in the microns, so tense. So, so we measure in what we call microns um, and a lot of our products are just like you said, uh, it's split in hairs. So if you just can imagine uh, a strand of hair and how thick a strand of hair is, I believe, and it's because hairs are different thicknesses depending on your hair texture, but typically on average, the uh, strand of hair is roughly, I believe it's one fifth or 150 to 200 microns. So we are applying on one part in specific, we apply two microns plus, or I'm sorry, four microns plus or minus two. So we're holding those tolerances here uh, at, in, in Virginia. So although we produce high volume work to the tune of millions of pieces per month, we are still held accountable uh, for quality standards with all of our suppliers. Um, and for every piece that we receive, our customers and suppliers um, send us those pieces. So there's a price assigned to the piece. So although we are paid for the outgoing product, we're held liable for the incoming product should we um, alter it and deem it unusable at outgoing. So you're not taking raw material and and creating a product. You have a you have someone else's product that they have paid for coming to you. You're applying a process to it and shipping it back to them. So you are Correct. responsible for that inventory that they've already paid for or counting on. You can't mess it up, right? Because that costs both of you money. Correct. Um, we're we're only supposed to add value. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that always blows my mind when you start talking about layers of chrome or zinc or or whatever metal you're applying in that in the, those measurements. I mean. Yes, yes, yes. And, and our quality team, our, our quality and, and our inspection teams go through a vigorous inspection training program. Um, and those, those individuals are not released to release product to our customers until all of that training is complete. So it's not as though we, we're, um, we can take anyone in the door and train them to be the level of inspector that we need them to be. Uh, the, the inspector position, although it's one of the most critical positions that we have here in the plant, we can train up those individuals to be a quality inspector. So no additional training is needed when you come in the door. When you come to Greystone, we will train you to get to the level that we need you. 
And would you say, I mean, I think a lot of concern about entering the manufacturing sector has to do with um, longevity in the career and your earning potential over time. You know, I think um, as the story goes, you get a college education that you can take with you anywhere and you're not as bound to a single employer. So there's a job stability component that I think made college as popular um, as it is. Um, that, of course, has started to come at a price that might not be sustainable. So there's these sort of tug and pull and pros and cons of what path you take. What can you tell us about sort of job stability or earning potential in the manufacturing sector? Uh, so job stability in the manufacturing sector, there will always be manufacturing. So I think there is the answer to your job stability question. There will always be manufacturing. And for us, Greystone specifically, as long as there are cars on the road, Greystone will be operating. So from a job stability standpoint, um, there is major stability, and at least in the markets that we service, because we service the automotive markets. And as long as there are cars being assembled, then we'll always have a uh, always have a market to service. And are your um, are the skills transferable to other? Would you say that um, you know? I don't think I don't think we're going to all of a sudden get to be massive uh, mass transit users and the cars in the U S are ever going anywhere. But let's just say as a, what if, I mean, if you're, if your employees had to pivot to a new industry or if you all pivoted to a new product, sort of how transferable are the skills from Greystone to either other manufacturing or, you know, if Greystone had to sort of reinvent itself. Yeah. So a lot of the applications that we use are in the building we could use in other areas of the building. So no process in the building is the same, but all processes in the building are alike. So uh, there, if, if an individual is trained in one area of our building, they can move to another, or if they're trained in one department, they can move to another department relatively easy. So the skill set that you'll learn here is very trans transferable within. Um, outside of this company, I, I will say the technical uh, skills that you learn here from the robotics, um, from some of the other proprietary uh, uh, things that we can train you up on, uh, you will be able to transfer for those uh, with you. And then as far as earning potential, I imagine knowing that you have employees now that could potentially have options, you know, you have to take that into account when you're putting together your, your um, salaries. So, would you say that students could come to you right out of high school and move up in the company and do well for themselves, support a family, have a comfortable um, lifestyle? You know, are your, how could you help kids understand really what their earning potential might be mm -hmm. um, in so, manufacturing? Okay, so our general workforce um, below the management level, uh, I, can you ask that question again? And I'm going to answer it again. Um, I, I don't know that you need to get into sort of ex exact pay scale, but what, how can you help students determine what their earning potential could be in a manufacturing career so that are they, will, will they cap out at something that, you know, they're going to outgrow and, it's okay for the first kid, but if you have the second one, you're going to need to move on kind of thing. I mean, like, how, does, is it a career that can kind of last throughout your lifetime in terms of your earning potential? Right. So I, I, on your earning potential, I'd say your earning potential is as much as you want to make. And I, I say that because on the uh, hourly side, if you would like to work overtime, we offer overtime to every employee and overtime has been offered every week this year, right? Mm -hmm. So if you'd like to receive overtime, if your normal pay uh, rate is not what you would like it to be and there's a need uh, for more hours, we do offer um, overtime. Um, for the ability to move up, uh, I will use myself as an example there. I came in as, or I joined Greystone as a production supervisor. My current role is plant manager. So again, you can move or earn as much as you would like. So you have to have that personal drive or have to have the, the need or want to move up or the, the need or want to be better and move up in an organization. 
Um, as an entry level employee, are there any certifications or education that would be favorable for them to be hired by Greystone that could help them in their job? Or do you all, I mean, you mentioned before you all do a lot of in-house training, but is there anything outside of that before they come to you all that could help? Um, any degrees or certifications that you may have or hold will be a plus, but none of our, none of those are needed um, or prerequisite prerequisites for any uh, positions here. Okay. For any entry level positions here. Right. So do you have um, job shadowing programs or are there opportunities for high school students who think they might be interested um, to sort of have any experience with Greystone, um, maybe short of getting hired on, right? Because that that there's probably age restrictions for you on that part. Um, but what what can a student do who thinks that this sounds interesting? Uh, so if a student thinks this is interesting, uh, what we do offer are internships. Uh, so if you know someone's on the fence of, hey, I may want to try this, or I may you know may want to give it a shot, or just to see what they have to offer, uh, we do offer internships. Um, in those, uh, you can apply for internship at any time. Uh, we also uh, will take any applicant that's of age and can work. So uh, if if someone is of age and, and they're thinking that, hey, Greystone may be the place to be, by all means, then come in as see our HR specialist and, and fill out an application. Now at your company, do you have to be 18 to do an yes. internship or have a, get a job? Yes, minimum age requirements are uh, 18, and that's uh, for our firearms department. Right. Okay. Is that so for your also? It's for every department, but that decision is driven by our, our firearms department. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So a student could come after high school, maybe if they're taking a couple classes at Thomas Nelson and just don't know what they want to do, they could do an internship? Because they'll be yes, 18. That, okay. Yeah, that's correct. And we do offer part time positions as well. So if a high school stu student, um, you know, is in their final semester or they're taking half classes um, and they want to go to school uh, for the day and once they finish for their complete school for the day, I uh, would like to uh, work at Greystone. Part time work is available as well. Uh, we are currently running uh, three shifts. Our shift schedules are. Uh, 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., 2 p.m. till 10 p.m., and 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. What's the most, um, what's the easiest to staff and the hardest to staff? What do people like <laughs> to work? No shock to anyone. First shift is the easiest and third shift is the hardest. Yeah. No, uh, no actually, second shift is the hardest to staff. Um, At 2 to 10? Yes, the two to ten is the hardest to staff. Um, the third shift is the uh, the second easiest to staff, of course. First shift being the easiest, everyone works once first shift, and uh, for some reason, a lot of our uh, workforce they like third shift. Um, but again, that second shift is, is the hardest one to staff. Hmm. I guess because you're not home from the five to whatever time people go to bed, so they probably want to be home during that time, especially if they have kids. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm not it's, sure. it's the perfect shift for high school interns because yes. they don't want to get up for 6 a.m. They don't mind being up until 10. They don't necessarily want dinner with their parents. So, I mean, it's kind of <laughs> right. perfect thing. We should market it that, Sherry, that 2 to two to 10 p.m. is kind of perfect. They yeah. can sleep till noon. Yep. <laughs> right, right. That does sound like a good idea. We might have just tapped into a whole new pipeline for you, Akeem. <laughs> there you go. I'll take it. I will take it. Especially now that kids are virtual because they're done at like, I think two, but some of them don't have a, um, a last block. So they're done at, I believe, noons. <laughs> That'd be perfect well, for your schedule. That it, it will work out for me and I'll, I'll gladly take it. Okay. I'll let them well, You guys follow up on the details. <laughs> we didn't, I think we kind of hit on all the questions that we had Um I think I asked you what you would do differently. What advice would you give to high school students trying to find out what they really want to do after high school? I would say follow your heart and don't be afraid to take risk. Right. So if, if, if you're thinking you want to do something, give it a shot. 
And if it, if you decide that, hey, you need to course correct or change course, then just change course. But don't, don't say you didn't try. That would be my best advice. I think, advice. I think it is one of those things that you kind of forget that, um, you know, your whole life, there will just be these things that change all along the way. It's a completely dynamic thing. So the point is to not get it 100% right, whatever you think that is, right out of the gate, right? I mean, that's that's the pressure I feel like sometimes we when we ask students what they think they want to do and what their path is and what their plan is, we kind of give this impression that they have to have this thing mapped out and then they have to follow it. And most of us have had things that come up along the way that have not fit into that plan. And that's actually been kind of a good thing. They've been good things that have happened that have not fit into the plan. And so you just adjust, right? You just yeah. did it. That's right. And just like you thought you were going to do computers and here you are in a different role. Yes, exactly. You often exactly. change along the path and it's okay. Yep, that's right. Um, you, you said so, it correctly. It's okay if you need to change paths. Yep. So I'll ask um, a little bit different question. What um, advice would you give to parents of high school students? Good question. Regarding going into manufacturing. I will say don't be afraid to support your kids' decisions. Not every manufacturing role is a bad manufacturing role. So although days in the manufacturing facility will be tougher than others, um, and some days it may look pretty, some days it may not look as pretty as others, but support your kids' decisions. My advice to the parents. All right. That sounds great. So I think that kind of wraps us up. Um, thanks for your time and we appreciate it. And hopefully we will have um, students come knocking on your door because they are now aware of a new opportunity that they did not know of before.